beginning as a popular supplement for the well-known Call of Cthulhu roleplay system, which subsequently evolved into its own independent game, Delta Green is the tale of the titular organization, a covert United States agency formed after a federal raid on Innsmouth, Massachusetts, in 1928, and entrusted with protecting the nation against otherworldly dangers. John Scott Tynes, co-creator of Delta Green, explained the general premise as the following. Delta Green is broadly about the fundamental tension in America between authority and agency, and narrowly about the visceral experience of the heroic tragedy. But in general, it's about damage. What do you do with it? How do you process it? Will you rise above it? Why do you succumb to it? It is full of damaged people. Some are met as allies, some as enemies. Some allies may become enemies, and the enemies stay that way. Delta Green is not about redemption, just sacrifice. The bleakness of the setting and the subject matter is thus intended for mature audiences, with themes of personal apocalypse and losing yourself in a relentless fight against unbeatable odds. In this video series, we will go over the Delta Green canon according to the 2016 Handler's Guide in hopes of sharing this fascinating setting and assisting new handlers in becoming acquainted with the game's lore. If you are interested in playing Delta Green, I strongly caution against viewing this as it could spoil possible hooks and reveals in your game. As such, without further ado, we will start at the beginning, July 17th of 1927, the fateful day a gentleman by the name of Robert Olmsted informed government officials of unnatural creatures in the town of Ensmouth. The group that would become Delta Green was born of a 1920s federal raid on Ensmouth, Massachusetts. According to Robert Martin Olmsted, an antiquarian student from Newburyport, who visited Innsmouth, Massachusetts, he met Zadok Allen, an elderly homeless drunk with wild tales of interbreeding with undersea monsters and the worship of strange South Sea gods. Forced to stay overnight in Innsmouth, Olmsted witnesses the residents' inhuman nature as he flees the town and realizes there must have been some truth to the drunk's tales. Two days later, he contacts government officials in Arkham of his experience in Innsmouth. His testimony leads to a federal investigation of Innsmouth. Aerial film footage is taken of Innsmouth and Devil's Reef, footage that requires censoring, while undercover agents infiltrate the town and take photos from within. Having once ordered a roundup of Reds while serving as governor of Massachusetts, President Calvin Coolidge authorized a raid on Innsmouth to root out the degenerate heathens that had been quietly terrorizing the area for decades. The Department of the Navy, in the form of the Office of Naval Intelligence, guided the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Coast Guard, who would provide firepower. Significantly, those three agencies were not explicitly banned from carrying out domestic law enforcement duties under the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act. To add legal authority, the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation, led by J. Edgar Hoover, was brought in to oversee the seizure of suspected alien seditionists for deportation. Organizational delays resulted in the raid being launched on the 23rd of February, 1928. On that day, the 42nd Marine Battalion arrives in the Boston Naval Annex, having been transported from Punta Gorda in Nicaragua to take part in Project Puzzle Box, as Delta Green renamed it in 1942, a combined operation of the Navy, the Treasury Department, and the Bureau of Investigation to clear Innsmouth of seditious aliens that had taken over the town. The forces of Project Puzzle Box fight the insane cultists and deep ones of Innsmouth for days, with battle finally ending with the launch of torpedoes at the undersea city of Yanathlai. Following the roundup of the strange religious order of which all townsfolk were members, the esoteric order of Dagon, 
The Treasury Department presents President Coolidge with photographic evidence of the curiously debased condition of Innsmouth's population. This ranged from birth defects such as webbed toes and fingers and odd scale ailments to wholly alien biologies, creatures that shared a somewhat human build but were totally inhuman. The people of Innsmouth called them Deep Ones. Even more disturbing, it seemed to confirm that Innsmouth's residents had bred with such creatures and that they eventually changed into grotesque beings over time. Artifacts demonstrating a pagan religion among the townspeople were also presented to the president and his cabinet. The Office of Naval Intelligence waited to deliver its full report until everything gathered could be analyzed. Still, considering the initial evidence, the Coolidge administration decided to detain the population affected indefinitely. After all, there was no rush. In the short term, the Innsmouth problem had been solved. The prisoners taken during Project Puzzle Box were tested for abnormalities. Those cleared as humans were released while the Deep One hybrids were sent to various naval and military prisons. While the operation was disguised as a prohibition raid, one tabloid newspaper carries the story of a torpedo attack beyond Devil's Reef and several liberal organizations complain of the treatment of prisoners taken at Innsmouth. These protests ceased after a confidential meeting with government officials and supervised tours to see the prisoners. O and I dispersed the 209 deep wound hybrids into military stockades in federal prisons across the country and subjected many to interrogation. The deep one hybrids taken at Innsmouth were relocated from the military and naval prisons to a purpose-built facility disguised as a naval air station in southern Arizona, later renamed YY-2. Sometime after that, most prisoners fall into a catatonic state. O and I also seized the ship logs of the Sumatra Queen, belonging to prominent Innsmouth resident Obed Marsh. They took a Marsh family history, dating back to 1862, badly burned scriptures of their inhuman faith, and five 24-kilogram conical stone tablets inscribed with strange glyphs. They found incomplete notes for translating the glyphs, compiled over many years by prominent Innsmouth resident Robert Marsh, killed during the raid. Unable to decipher much of what it found, O and I turned to the Black Chamber for help. The Black Chamber was a nickname of a Joint War Department and State Department Signals Intelligence and Cryptography Unit. It operated during World War I as Section 8 of Military Intelligence MI8, and after 1919 as the Cipher Bureau. The Black Chamber provided communication security for the American delegation during the 1919 Versailles negotiations. Later, at the 1922 Washington Naval Conference, they broke the Japanese code and provided crucial intelligence to the American negotiators. As the U.S. government's premier secret cryptographic organization, the Black Chamber was O and I's first choice to translate the materials captured in Innsmouth. In April 1928, the Black Chamber took possession of the papers and strange tablets recovered there. Despite their expertise, it took two years for the cryptographers to complete the translation. On November 2, 1929, they presented a report on what had come to be called the Book of Dagon to the newly elected President Herbert Hoover. This was the first Hoover had heard of Innsmouth, and 1929 had already been a challenging year. First, it was revealed during a crucial summit that the Black Chamber intercepted Japanese diplomatic radio traffic, and the Japanese were repudiating the naval limits of the Washington Naval Conference. Second, following the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the President was under intense pressure to bring Al Capone to justice and was immensely displeased with the Treasury and Justice Department's failure. And lastly, on October 24, 1929, the stock market crashed. When the Black Chamber presented its findings less than a week after Black Tuesday, the exhausted President Hoover was less in an receptive mood. His opinion was that these eggheads had already ruined a perfectly good deal with Japan. 
Now they were telling fairy tales about monsters under the sea. He ordered Secretary of State Henry L. Stimson to disband the organization using the Washington Naval Conference scandal as cover and shut down the group. He wrote in a 1948 memoir, Gentlemen don't read each other's mail. J. Edgar Hoover, the ambitious director of the Bureau, saw the writing on the wall and redacted his previous reports on the Innsmouth Raid, stating that he personally observed nothing that could not be explained through conventional science and that the town was filled with inbred bootlegger and anarchists. Nothing more. O and I wasn't blind to the administration's mood, and they also distanced themselves from the Black Chamber's report. Still, elements of the Navy clearly recognized the threat that a hostile aquatic civilization posed to U.S. naval supremacy. The Treasury Department, the Justice Department, and the White House could delude themselves, but the Navy could not. To continue their investigations of the Innsmouth threat, the Navy got creative. In World War I, the Office of Naval Intelligence established an obscure research group called the Parapsychology, Paranormal, and Psychic Phenomena Desk, abbreviated to P4, to study the inexplicable phenomena that might impact the war. Once it had a staff of nearly 50, but by 1928, it had withered to two desk-bound Navy officers and a support staff of six. Its officers spent their time clipping world newspaper articles on ghosts, psychic oddities, and spiritual phenomena, only very occasionally passing something up to headquarters. Other ONI desks, assembling files of intelligence on the world's navies, thought P-4 was a joke. In 1929, the P-4 desk suddenly commanded a strange group of cryptographers and combat troops. First came a few black chamber codebreakers who had translated the Book of Dagon, and they were now hidden at P-4 so that their work might continue. Later, P-4 was handed a small force of marines, and a detachment of treasure agents, almost entirely of Innsmouth veterans. This became the backbone of the Navy's response to its uncovered horrors. The Navy had learned an important lesson at Innsmouth, one it would pass down to generations of Delta Green agents to come. Never tell a president anything you don't have to. When O and I restaffed P4 with this odd mix, it set its new mission as well. To scour the world for inhuman beings like those found at Innsmouth. At first, not everyone at P4 was convinced that there were other such horrors. Still, the Deep One hybrids in custody at YY2 were an unpleasant reminder that nothing was impossible. The search would lead to a broader picture of unnatural things living in the benighted depths of the sea. Studying and interrogating the prisoners revealed little, but those that died in captivity were subjected to extensive post-mortem examinations, proving that many were something other than human. Navy expeditions took P-4 personnel across the globe in search for colonies like Innsmouth and they soon found them. The following Deep One colony was discovered in 1930 on a small island in the Philippines. A raid by P-4 Marines and Filipino scouts shattered the island's defenses and rounded up Deep One hybrids, nicknamed Operation Talcum. Ultimately, the results of this operation are a triumphant success, as the P-4 raid brought in over 500 prisoners and a trove of artifacts related to the esoteric order of Dagon. When the general location of the undersea portion of the colony was ascertained, the Navy pulverized it with depth charges. Filipino Muslims from nearby islands, having long suffered the Deep One's depredations, finished off those that escaped. In 1933, during the American occupation of Nicaragua, Another colony was discovered on the country's Pacific coast. Operating among Marines assigned to track anti-US rebel Augusto Sandino, P-4 officers found a fishing village that had just begun to adopt the teachings of the esoteric order of Dagon. As P-4 raids the Nicaraguan fishing village of Agua Verde on the Mosquito Coast, also known as Operation Bakelite, there is a bit of a complication, as the intervention was bungled. P-4 was relying on Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somasa's National Guard to handle initial contact. However, 
Horrified by the alien nature of many of the villagers, the National Guardsmen massacred the village and put it to the torch. The P-4 officers had to swiftly sanitize the site and recover several dozen artifacts before moving to the United States. However, these artifacts hint towards an unknown city known as Yan Ho, possibly in China, as the source of the cult. Nearby reefs, considered likely sites for Deep One colonies, were hit by depth charges and torpedoed. Following the bungled Operation Bakelite in Nicaragua, P-4 officer Lester Green and 22 men enter the wilds of China to locate the mystical city of Yan Ho, which, according to multiple sources, is the origin of the teachings which form the basis of the esoteric order of Dagon. However, not all goes as planned, and Lester Dean stumbles into a Chinese village on the Yangtze, incoherently babbling about a secret city in the mountains. The Office of Naval Intelligence commits him to the nearest friendly madhouse, a British institution in Hong Kong. Due to this disastrous failure, P-4 confines its investigation to the United States. Near Innsmouth, P-4 officers used a ritual recovered in their raids to make contact with Deep Ones, to acquire more samples for study. While none were taken alive, numerous damaged specimens were obtained for dissection. Many in P-4 felt that if they ambushed enough, the Deep Ones would be deterred from answering such a summit by their hybrid allies. Some officers pass up inquiries to the chain of command for other, more dangerous rituals to attempt. However, none were allowed. As P-4 shifted to primarily focus on US operations, it began to target groups that it determined were engaged in unconventional dangerous activities. Overworked and underfunded, P-4 investigators often arrived after action by local authorities had already taken place and could only cover up the mess. Many clues were covered by P-4, both seized correspondence and suspects captured at cult rituals pointed towards the Pacific and Asia as the source of the cult, which remains known in the West as the Esoteric Order of Dagon. P-4 was not alone in their notice and pursuit of the unnatural. The horrors of the Great War awoke movements in both England and Russia to destroy, cover up, capture, and study those things discovered that were beyond human understanding. In 1916, with the British intelligence apparatus MI6 pushed to the limit, the government looked in unusual places to curb the U-boat threat, which had posed a stranglehold on international shipping. They found Lt. Commander Frederick Ramsey and his stable of quote-unquote talents, intelligence analysts who claimed to possess psychic abilities that allowed them to see remote locales and even the future. By World War II, this force was designated MI-13, called Pisces, or the Paranormal Intelligence Section for Counterintelligence, Espionage, and Sabotage. Likewise, in the Russian Civil War of 1918 to 1920, Russian intelligence encountered a cult of cannibalistic humanoids feeding on the dead, identified as ghouls. From there, this small secret group began to uncover more and more unnatural threats to the motherland. By the beginning of World War II, this group was officially recognized as GRU SV-8, or translated from Russian as the Chief Intelligence Directorate of the General Staff Special Department 8. Later, by 1939, with the rising nationalistic fervor of the Nazi party and its singular obsession with the occult, SS Commander Heinrich Himmler created a secret organization within the Nazis to investigate and exploit the hidden power of the unnatural called the Karoltekia. In the following video series, we will analyze the rise of the Karoltekia along with the developments World War II brings to the world of Delta Green. If there are any suggestions, whether they be technical or just recommendations on future subjects to cover, please be sure to leave them in the comment below, and if you could support me by subscribing and liking the video, it would be much appreciated. Thank you for viewing, good day, and good luck.